I wanted to start out by talking a little bit about the order, the chronology of making your book, the art process behind it. Okay, so one of the first things the students will need to do is to choose their medium and the materials that they're going to use. All of their materials, all of their flat materials as they're working on them, they're going to want to have some kind of folder or some kind of binder where they can keep everything and keep it organized. If they're working on any kind of wet media, they just have to kind of figure out how they're going to uh, keep that, allow it to dry and then keep things kind of tucked into their binder or into their folder, into their box so that everything stays together. If they're doing collage or anything that's a little bit sticky and they're worried about glue around the edge of something that they, that they adhere to the paper, they can put wax paper down. Wax paper can be a real valuable asset and they may consider just kind of so that they make sure that they have the colors that they need and the same materials that they need over time as this project will take them quite some time. They may want to kind of keep their own Ziploc bag with their materials or something kind of like that so that they can make sure that their stuff is clearly labeled, set apart, and ready for them to kind of pick back up from where they left off. Okay, so we're going to talk about medium and art material and kind of how your students can choose the medium that's going to both best tell their story and also be readily available to them. So I'm going to kind of just present a really wide range of, of books and then students can kind of uh, pick which option might work for them. So this is um, in my Nana's house. This is all acrylic paint on canvas. Of course, with acrylic paint, you can also paint on like a mixed media paper or a heavyweight paper like tag board. Um, you can also paint on canvas paper. Something that some students may enjoy is kind of this combination of uh, like a mixed media pen and ink. So they can use like a black pen or a brush pen and maybe watercolor paint or gouache paint. Watercolor is among the most economical paints, watercolor and tempera. And then um, pen and ink also has such a powerful impact on top, okay? Some students, again, this is another example of mixed media, another color, uh, color profile. So this is some um, acrylic paint combined with um, with some marker and uh, which I believe was done digitally. Some students may be interested in uh, working digitally on something like Procreate or um, Photoshop. Every student works at their own pace and we really wanna set the students up for success and being able to successfully complete their book and turn it in within the competition due date and um, feel good about where they landed at the end. So. It's important when you kind of like lay out the way that you're gonna sign this book that you kind of keep in mind what parts are gonna take your students the longest to complete. Because in my experience, the, doing the finished art definitely takes the most amount of time. And it will also depend on the type of work that they decide to do, okay? And also the speed of each individual student. But I would just say kind of keep that in mind and encourage your students to kind of have a realistic idea of how long it takes them to finish each illustration because what you don't want is for them to work on four beautiful finishes that take the whole time and then they've got eight pages left to do with no time left. One thing you may want to invite your students to do if they don't do so already is to start to keep a sketchbook. And a sketchbook does not need to be something that they buy at the store or something that they use to kind of show their friends how beautifully they draw. Um, kind of on the contrary, the sketchbook, I would encourage the students to think of as a place for them to kind of work out their ideas, make their terrible drawings, and make their kind of really rough mistakes that that we all make when we're kind of trying to come up with something new. So what I would do is make it be the least precious object um, that is worth saving. Okay, so for example, this one is just about four pieces of paper folded in half and stapled with a piece of gray paper across the top, just a piece of construction paper. I wrote sketchbook, keep out. It is a private thing for your student. They can share it if they want to, but I don't want it to be a place where they feel like under pressure to make a good drawing. I'm going to take you through this exercise of drawing the moving figure. And I'm sure everybody has their own way of teaching this. I'm just going to show you mine just to kind of get students started if they're feeling stuck. I start out with the head and just doing the basic um, drawing wherever there is a joint, drawing a little ellipse or a little oval. And then wherever there's a bone, drawing um, straight lines. Okay, so from shoulder to elbow, elbow to wrist, 
Okay, and then the torso. And, you know, the proportions will be a little bit different if it's a child or if it's a grown-up. The hips to the knees to the feet. Okay, and so then what I like the students to do is to think about a pose once they've kind of drawn this straight on view. And maybe they're going to do a pose where somebody is um, doing maybe like a kick to the side or something. And I always encourage them to kind of maybe look at a photo reference or have somebody pose for them. But maybe in this one, the head will be lower. Here's the neck and the shoulders will be tilted. Okay, here's the hips. One hand is out. And then maybe one hand is going this way. And then we're, the foot that they're standing on could be like that. Maybe this leg is extended. And, I, you know, I think that the good thing about these exercises, if you do them with your students, is that it's good to kind of show them that it doesn't have to be perfect. Okay, it, it can, that you can kind of make your mistakes that maybe the body looks a little off or whatever, just as a way to loosen them up. But basically, wherever there's, you know, talk to them about where the joints are, wherever your body moves, and that's where the circles go, or that's where the, um, the ovals go. Okay, and then once they have this, then they can start to think about, okay, now I'm going to, I'm going to clothe this person. I'm going to put a shirt on them, and I'm going to go in with my eraser, and I'm actually going to take this out so I can start to think about this person actually as my character. Okay, and then you can kind of go in with your eraser, and then all of a sudden this person has pants on instead of these um, circular joints. All right, but I think, you know, not everybody's going to have human characters, um, but I think it's good for them to start thinking about how they can have um, people in motion. If they do, if their characters are humans, how they, they can have them in motion and how they can have them be a little bit uh, more dynamic. Okay, so I would say um, take them through show them this exercise. And then if you can, just kind of do the exercise with them and um, then invite them to maybe pose for each other or invite them to take a screenshot of somebody else doing a pose and then kind of break down where that person is moving and what the position looks like. Another thing we really want to be able to do is to show expression in our characters' faces. And this is a way to kind of uh, help the students warm that side up a little bit. And whether you're, whether their character is a robot or a rodent or a human, um, it still is important regardless to have them be able to show some kind of um, expression and emotion so that the reader will relate to them. So what I like to do is kind of start out with these, um, with these kind of oval, like, parentheses head and parentheses bottom. When I have a student who says, I can't draw, I say, okay, well, can you make a parentheses? And they say, yes. So they make a parentheses. And they say, can you make a smaller parentheses? And they say, okay. So then they make a smaller parentheses. And then I say, okay, now connect them. And obviously it might look a little funny like this one does, or maybe I need to bring it down a little bit more, but you get the idea. Then you've kind of got this shape of the head. Okay, now once you have that, I have these kind of guides here. This one is for about halfway down. And obviously, if you have your own way that you prefer to teach this, then by all means, this is just something that's worked for me in the past. Um, so we've got the eye line about halfway down, the nose line, which is about halfway between the eye and the chin, and then the mouth line. And then again, I like to encourage the students if they say, I don't know how to draw the eyes, you know, again, can you make a parentheses and another parentheses? So we kind of do this with the idea that they can fit they could fit another eye in between the two eyes, okay? Now, this is just to kind of warm them up, okay? And then um, the nose, you know, people draw noses every different kind of way. I kind of like to make it nice and simple, um, sometimes just like with a curved line at the bottom or like a three-way curved line at the bottom. And then, of course, all of these marks will change a little bit as we add expression. Okay, now up, up about halfway in between the eyes and the top of the head is going to be the hairline from where the hair grows, not if they have bangs or something like that. And then along the eye line is also going to be the ear line. Okay, and then of course above the eyes are the ever important expressive eyebrows. Okay, so then once a student has that, they can start thinking about, okay, if I'm going to do this on my own, okay, and I'm going to make my own character, I'm going to think about what is the expression. So if they're making a smile, um, 
a lot of people want to start their smile and say like this. Okay, but I encourage the students to actually put their finger on their top lip and notice that if there's a smile, that top lip is often straight across and the bottom lip is curved. So maybe this is going to be the smile straight across or slightly curved down. Okay, so maybe here's the mouth. I'm going to start here. Then I'm going to put the nose. Now what happens, and I encourage students to put their finger under their eye, sorry, just like this. Okay, and when you smile, when uh, what happens to your eye? It goes up. Okay, so I encourage them to show that in their drawing. If this is the top lid and they're smiling, then the bottom lid is curved, curving up because that's what our cheek kind of pushes that up. Okay, all of a sudden you have somebody who's expression has changed. Okay. And then you can also have them do things like put their finger on their eyebrow and notice what happens to their eyebrow if they frown. And they might, they might notice that it kind of goes down and then they could kind of change or if they're scowling, they could kind of change the position of the mouth. And maybe there's a line that they can feel, but I find that if I have my students put their hands on their faces in places that move when we change our expression, they can better get at um, uh, better get at a different feeling. Okay, so you can very quickly go from a kind of happy expression to a sad expression. And I think that this is the fun thing about this exercise is you've got your eye line, your nose line, your mouth line, is you can have the students play with it in a way that can be surprising. Okay, so maybe in one, you have a young girl with two big puffs and a, and a smile, okay? But then maybe you say, oh, I wanna change that. And then you just change a few things, change the hairline, change maybe what's around the eyes, add some lines to the face, and then all of a sudden, maybe you have like an old man, okay? A balding old man. Okay, so it can be fun, a fun way for them to play with it and then, um, and then build out the expressions of the characters as much as possible, okay? So that is one way to kind of get them going on thinking about uh, showing expression in their characters. And again, have them, encourage them to play, encourage them to do this as much as they want on their own and to feel the relationship on their faces between the different features and what happens to them when they, um, when they play around with their, um, with their expressions.